Welcome to another of our Discovery series. This series comes to you direct via satellite from Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne is a city of three and a half million people. It was voted recently as the most livable city in the world. The Yarra River runs through the city, giving the city an unusual charm and beauty. Often you'll see people jogging along the side of the river, maybe riding their bikes or walking. It's a city of universities, commerce, industry, culture, a city of the arts. But Melbourne is considered to be the sport capital of Australia and possibly the sport capital of the world. But we've come to this discovery series to look beyond what's happening around us and to look at what's going on above us. We've come to answer the deepest questions of life. We've come to probe those answers and to find meaning and purpose in life. So come with us on a journey of discovery into God's Word. My lecture title today is this. Here's my lecture title. My lecture title is The Real Truth About an Attempted Change in God's Law. When Man Tries to Change the Constitution of Heaven. Have you ever noticed that some things that we believed were true down through the centuries were not true at all? Have you ever noticed how we have tried to cling or hold on to certain traditions. For hundreds of years, many people believed that the Earth was the center of the solar system. They believed that the sun rotated around the Earth, that the Earth was fixed. They said, look, we don't feel the Earth moving. The Earth must not be moving. The Earth must be a fixed body. So therefore, they said, the the Earth is the center of the solar system. In fact, do you know that the church taught that the earth was the center of the solar system? And whoever would defy the church by saying that the sun was the center of our solar system? In fact, do you know that if you accepted the idea that the sun was the center of our solar system, that you could be punishable of death at one period of time or burned at the stake? It was a free-thinking pole that broke loose of the tradition. His name was Copernicus. He said, no, the earth is not the center of the solar system. The sun is the center of our solar system. But it took real courage because society believed something different. There was a time that science taught that the earth was flat and that if you kept floating and floating, if you kept sailing in your boat long enough, that you'd go off the edge of a flat earth. Well, we know today the earth isn't flat. We know that you don't sail off the edge of it if you go in the boat. But for a long time, people wanted to cling to that tradition. Probably one of the traditions that we today would look back at and say, that's kind of ridiculous, but yet it was believed for hundreds of years is this. Aristotle, the great philosopher, said, spiders are an insect, and all insects have six legs. So spiders, being an insect, must have six legs. Nobody questioned Aristotle. I mean, are you going to question Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher? Who's ever going to question Aristotle? If Aristotle says spiders have six legs, spiders must have six legs. If Aristotle says spiders are an insect, spiders must be an insect. I'm not going to question Aristotle. He's an authority figure. Many people today, incidentally, don't want to question any of their church leaders. But pretty soon, Jean Baptiste Lamarck came along. And he said, spiders are not an insect at all. Somebody count those legs. One, two, three, four, 
five spiders, spiders have eight legs. The tradition was broken because somebody was willing to stop, not take the tradition or word of another, and count. I wonder, has there been a tradition that's entered the door of the Christian church? Has there been a tradition that many Christians have clung to? A tradition that they would fight for? A tradition that they would not be willing to give up? Could it be that you and I have accepted a tradition? A tradition passed down through hundreds of years, passed down over the centuries. Nobody questions it. Everybody just kind of does it, but yet it is a tradition. The book of Revelation talks about the devil as the great deceiver. And he points out that many people today would be deceived by the evil wiles of Satan. Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. So Satan would be a deceiver. He deceived one-third of the angels in heaven. He told them that it wasn't necessary to obey, and so he was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So Satan, the great deceiver, deceived one-third of the angels in heaven. If the devil could deceive one third of the angels, beings that had never fallen by sin, beings that were always in the presence of God, his cunning wiles must be powerful. The devil is a deceiver. He deceived one third of the angels into thinking that you didn't have to obey God, that to obey the law was rather narrow, that to obey the law kept you in bondage. The devil came to Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he said, Eve, what difference does a tree make? Some people today think, what difference does a day make? He said, Eve, what difference does a tree make? All trees are alike. Eve, take of this tree and you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. God wants to restrict your freedom. God wants to keep you in bondage. I want to set you free. And Eve listened to the voice of Lucifer and followed his deceptions reached out and disobeyed God. You see, it wasn't a matter of trees. It was a matter of obedience. It was a matter of who would Eve listen to, what God said or what Lucifer said. What would Eve follow, the teachings of Lucifer or the teachings of Jesus Christ? Who would would be her supreme ruler, a created being or the creator? See, it was much more than a matter of a tree. It was a matter of obedience to the living God. Isn't it logical that Satan, the great deceiver, would attack God's law? Isn't it logical if the devil lost heaven because of disobedience and said it wasn't necessary to obey, if the devil led Adam and Eve into disobedience on earth and said it wasn't necessary to obey, take the fruit, isn't it logical that the object of Satan's attack today would be God's law? Isn't it logical as well that he would especially attack the fourth commandment that talks about worshiping the creator? Isn't it logical that Satan, would, the great deceiver, would attack the creator by challenging the symbol of creation? God created the heavens and the earth. He gave the Sabbath as a sign of his redemptive authority. He gave the Sabbath as a sign of true worship. So if the devil wants to undermine all worship, he'd attack the Sabbath. If the devil wants to undermine God's authority, he would attack the symbol of that authority, the Bible Sabbath. The Sabbath is a sign between God and his people. It was a sign between God and Adam and Eve. God gave the Sabbath in the Garden of Eden. The Sabbath was a sign that God gave in his Ten Commandment law that he wrote with his own finger on tables of stone. The Sabbath was kept by prophets down through the Old Testament, kept by Jesus. It'll be kept in heaven. So it's been God's sign The devil hates that sign. It's just like, let's suppose somebody took the Australian flag and they wanted to defile and trash Australia. They started burning the flag. Every Australian in their hearts would have something well up within them and say, that's our flag. Stop doing that. Don't defile it. Somebody said, well, it's only cloth. It's only only colors. Yes, but it's what it symbolizes. It symbolizes our great nation of Australia. So the Sabbath symbolizes that God created the heavens and the earth. And Satan hates that. He hates the creator. So it's logical that he'd attack it. The Sabbath is at the heart 
of this controversy over worship. Revelation chapter 14, verse 7 says, Worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Worship the creator. Revelation 14, 7 is an appeal to all humanity everywhere to worship the creator. Revelation 14, 9 says, Do not worship the beast. So Revelation 14, 7 is true worship. Worship the creator. Revelation 14, 9, do not worship the beast. Revelation 14, 12 says, here are they that keep the commandments of God. So the whole controversy between Christ and Satan is over worship, and it focuses this battle of the universe is a battle between good and evil. It's a battle over worship. Who is worthy of our worship? Who is worthy of our allegiance? It's a battle between the creator and Lucifer, or the creator and the beast power at end time. And it centers in God's law. Who changed the Bible Sabbath from Saturday the seventh day to the Sunday that we see most popular in our society? Well, certainly God didn't. Because the Bible says, Exodus 20, verse 8 to 10, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. God said, remember. If the law that God wrote with his own finger on tables of stone was to be changed, nobody would have the authority to change it unless God himself would change it. And there is not one text in the Bible that indicates that God himself would change the Sabbath. God didn't change it. He said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath, not of the Jew, but of the Lord your God. It must be incredibly important because God himself said to remember it. Did God change the Sabbath? What did he say? Malachi 3 verse 6, for I am the Lord and I do not what? I do not what? Change. So would God change his law? He said, I do not change. So God didn't change the Sabbath. Who changed the Bible Sabbath? Jesus didn't change the Sabbath. The Bible says that as his custom was, every Sabbath Jesus came to worship. So Jesus did not change the Bible Sabbath. You know, if Christ was going to change the Sabbath, he would have done it in his life. He would have left a legacy different than he did. But he didn't change the Sabbath. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 8, that Jesus Christ is what? The same yesterday, today, and for how long? Forever. So Jesus didn't change it. In fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 5, Mark chapter 2, verse 27, and 8, and Mark and Matthew 12, verse 8, that the Sabbath was his special Lord's day. So God didn't do it. Jesus didn't do it. Did the disciples do it? Who changed the Bible Sabbath? The disciples certainly didn't. The apostles kept the Sabbath. The apostle Paul talked about a whole city that came to worship with him on the Bible Sabbath. In fact, in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, the Bible says, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Did the disciples change the Sabbath? Certainly not. They said we ought to obey God rather than men. So how was it changed? I'm going to take you with me today on a journey of discovery, a journey through the Bible. And we will look at the Bible prophecies and see how the Bible predicted that at a time of compromise, human beings, human religious leaders, some of them well-meaning, but who compromised the integrity of their faith, would change the Bible Sabbath. We'll show the prophecies in the Bible that teach that that would happen. Then we're going to open the history books and show from history when and where and exactly how it happened. Certainly God or Jesus or the disciples would not change the very law of God written with God's own finger on tables of stone that would be an eternal code of conduct for all humanity. In fact, many of uh, the religions of the world recognize that the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, Saturday. Let's go to the faith of our fathers. Uh, This was written by James Cardinal Gibbons, one of the most uh, eminent and popular of all Roman Catholic scholars. What did this Catholic scholar say about the Sabbath? Here's what he said. Faith of our fathers, page 561, Cardinal Gibbons. Of course, it has the special imprimatur of the Pope at the time. He said, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. 
and you'll not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. This is the Catholic Cardinal. I certainly agree with him in this. And he said, the scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. So even our Catholic friends recognize that if you go by the Bible and the Bible only, you will go back to keeping that day that's a memorial of the creation, Saturday, the true Bible, Sabbath. The Anglican Archbishop spoke in Toronto, Canada, and uh, the front page of the newspaper carried an article about his speech. He really stirred up the Baptists and the Anglicans and the Pentecostals, and he really stirred up all the, the preachers in the city. And he got, got quite a stir going there. This is October 26, 1949, Toronto Daily Star. They reported him what he did. Reverend Philip Carrington, and I'm quoting from the newspaper, Anglican Archbishop of Quebec sent local clergymen into a huddle today by saying outright that there was nothing to support Sunday being kept holy. I mean, that's quite a statement by the archbishop, isn't it? And he really got him shook up. Carrington definitely told a church meeting in this city of straight-laced Protestantism that tradition, not the Bible, made Sunday the day of worship. God didn't change the Sabbath. Jesus didn't change the Sabbath. The disciples didn't change the Sabbath. The archbishop was right. It was tradition that came into the church after the death of the disciples that brought Sunday keeping into the church. How did that tradition come into the church? What historical events took place? Who really changed the Sabbath? Now, there's something quite remarkable. The Bible predicted that human beings, human religious leaders, and political leaders would meet together, that the Sabbath of God would be changed. The Bible actually predicted there would be a change, and it warned us against that compromise. The book of Revelation is the book of symbols in the New Testament. The book of Daniel is the book of symbols in the Old Testament. You can never fully understand Revelation until you understand Daniel. You can never understand Daniel unless you complement it with Revelation. So let's go back from the book of Revelation to a prophecy in Daniel. One night, as Daniel was sleeping, he saw in vision prophetic beasts. He saw a lion with eagle's wings. He saw a bear with three ribs in its mouth and blood dripping from its mouth, raising up on one side. He saw a leopard, a strange leopard, with wings on its back and four heads uh, racing through the sky. And he saw a beast that's kind of like a dragon, kind of a very fierce beast with ten horns that was breathing out fire. Daniel wondered about the meaning of these beasts, and God explained to him step by step the meaning. This dream is found in Daniel chapter 7. And as Daniel describes it, he says this in Daniel 7 verse 2. Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring upon the great sea. Now, here here is a symbolic vision. Now, there are many people that say, how do you understand the symbols of the Bible? You just really can't understand them. It's everybody's guess. If God gives the vision, God himself will explain the vision. So God himself explains this vision. In the Bible, wind, when it talks about four winds, it's talking about the four directions of the compass, north, south, east, and west, something universal. So, Four represents universality, north, south, east, west. Winds in the Bible, Jeremiah chapter 49, 15 and onward tell us, winds are a symbol of destruction. Like, for example, a power, great power and destruction. Like uh, a hurricane, destructive. A tornado is destructive. So here's four winds of heaven. So here's from the four corners of the earth, there's some destruction occurring. It says they were stirring the great sea. Revelation 17 verse 15 says... The sea that you saw are peoples, nations, and tongues. We in English sometimes say, I looked over the crowd and I saw the great sea of humanity. Or the great sea of people. So here, four winds blowing on the sea, there's war among people. Then he says, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from one another. So these four beasts that come up out of the sea are four, they're four something, and we'll see what the something is, but the, they're for something coming up in the midst of turmoil. Like the wind blows the sea and there are big waves and so forth, so there'd be the turmoil of war, the turmoil of conflict, and here you have these beasts, whatever they are, coming up amidst this conflict. Well, what are these beasts? Those great beasts which you saw are four. 
There are four kings that will rise out of the earth. He continues. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth what? Kingdom on the earth. So the, earth, the beasts are a king or more accurately a kingdom. So four kingdoms would rise from Daniel's day. In Bible prophecy, the prophets see always begins where the prophet is. So four beasts would rise. There'd be four kingdoms. They would rise successively beginning in Daniel's day. They would take us down the stream of time. One of these kingdoms would fall apart. And out of the falling apart of this kingdom, there would rise a new kingdom, a new power that would attempt to change God's law. We're going to go down the chain of this prophecy, look at who these four kingdoms are, see what would happen to the fourth kingdom, see how God's law was changed. We'll look at it in prophecy, then we'll look at it in history. It's an amazing journey. So the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. Do you remember in Daniel when we came back? It seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it? We came back and we were studying in our early meetings about the great beasts, of the great images of prophecy. And there we studied about this image in Daniel chapter 2. Do you remember studying this image in Daniel chapter 2 together? Here, the image in Daniel 2 had four metals, gold, silver, brass, and iron. Just like the four beasts represent four successive world-ruling powers, the four metals represented four successive world-ruling powers. Notice the similarity between the metals and the beasts. Now, to refresh your memory... In Daniel chapter 2, God's word named Babylon as the head of gold. In Daniel chapter 5, God's word named Medo-Persia as the second empire, the breasts and arms of silver. In Daniel chapter 8, God's word named Greece as as brass. And the legs of iron representing Rome. You remember the legs of iron had toes, ten toes, that represented the divided Roman Empire. Because Rome did not was not conquered by a fifth world ruling empire. It was overthrown. So we know what the four nations are. Gold, Babylon. Silver, Medo-Persia. Brass, Greece. Legs of iron, Rome. Divided Europe after the legs of iron. We've already studied this. This has been an outline in our lecture. And we spent an hour looking at who this image of gold was. Now, just as there were four metals, there are four beasts. Just as Gold is the chiefest of metals representing the nation where Daniel lived, Babylon. So the lion is the king of the beasts representing where Daniel lived in Babylon as well. The thing that is so amazing is this. The Bible talks about the symbol of Babylon as a lion with eagle's wings. When the archaeologists uncovered Babylon, Robert Coldaway, German archaeologist, digging digging in the ruins of Babylon. He uncovered its walls. Babylon on the walls had lions with eagles' wings as a symbol of Babylon. You know, sometimes today we have uh, animals that symbolize nations, don't we? And that's the same way it was there. Medo-Persia, represented in the silver, was represented as a bear. Greece, and the thighs of brass, was represented as a leopard. Rome, legs of iron, was represented in this beast with ten horns. The ten toes of the image, just like the ten horns. Babylon the lion with eagle's wings. We see that on the walls of Babylon today. We can see it with our eyes, uncovered. We don't have to guess at what that is. Medo-Persia. The bear lifts itself up on one side, but the bear has three ribs in its mouth. What's this symbolism? Medo-Persia. A dual empire. Medes, one leg. Persians, the other leg. The Persians dominate over the Medes. The Persians lift up on one side. When they attack, they destroy three nations, For the Medes and the Persians to conquer the world, they had to attack Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon. So you have the bear with the three ribs in its mouth, the three nations that ate to conquer the world. You see, or to conquer the then-known world, the Middle Eastern Mediterranean world would be more accurate. Then you have Greece. Who was the great leader of Greece? You know who that was. Who was that? Yeah, Alexander the Great. How old was Alexander when he conquered the world? How old was he? Does he know? 33 years old. What do you know about Alexander? He conquered the world quickly, rapidly. He did it very swiftly. If you wanted to depict rapid conquest, what animal would you choose? You'd choose a what? Leopard. But if you wanted to depict rapid, 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 rapid conquest, what would you do with your leopard? You would do what? Put wings on him. Exactly what God did. But wait a minute. Here's the rapid conquest of Alexander the Great. But what do you notice about this uh, animal that's different? What is about his head? So what do you notice? He has four what? Heads. When Alexander died at 33, 
He had four generals, Cassandra, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. They looked at one another and said, look, we're stupid if we fight one another and kill, the empire, kill, us, kill one another off to have Alexander's position. Let's have a four-headed empire. You go your way, I'll go my way. We'll protect one another. Cassandra, Cassandra Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Seleucus, the four heads, exactly. You see, Bible prophecy is so accurate. So there's Babylon, there's Medo-Persia, there's Greece. Then, Daniel 7, verse 7, after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast is the fourth empire in succession. The first is Babylon, the second is Medo-Persia, third is Greece, fourth is Rome. And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. He's exceeding, exceeding strong, and he had huge iron teeth. The fourth metal in the image of Daniel 2, after the gold, silver, and bronze, was iron, iron legs. The fourth beast has iron teeth, same power. It was devouring and breaking in pieces, trampling with the residue of its feet. So here you have this fourth beast representing the nation of Rome. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. How was it different? It had ten horns. All of the other powers were succumbed or overthrown by another world-ruling power. Babylon was overthrown by Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia was overthrown by Greece. Greece was overthrown by Rome. But Rome would not be overthrown by another power. It would be divided up just like the ten toes of the iron legs. It would have ten horns. The ten horns, of course, represent the divisions of that old ancient Roman Empire into the divisions of Europe. We see today, as we look at Rome, and we look back at history, it wrote, the Roman Empire was all across Europe. It came down into the Middle East. It was across northern Africa. Jesus was born in the days of the Roman Empire. Pilate was a Roman governor that tried Jesus. Jesus was crucified by Roman soldiers. So Rome was ruling in the days of Jesus. What would happen after the days of Rome? A fifth world ruling empire would not overthrow Rome. The Bible says that it would be divided into ten divisions. That has exactly happened. History has been following God's word like a blueprint. The Anglo-Saxons came down, settled in England, the Suevi over here on the left, in the area of Portugal, the Visigoths in the area of Spain, and so forth throughout Europe. Now, here's where it becomes interesting. We're looking at divided Europe. We're after the days of Babylon, after the days of Medo-Persia, after the days of Greece, after the days of Rome. We're in the days of the divided Roman Empire. We're after the days of Jesus. We're in the days of early Christianity now, third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries. And the Bible says, Daniel 7, verse 8, I was considering the horns. What do the horns represent? All those divisions of Europe. He said, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. He says, I was looking at those horns. I was looking at divided Europe in the early centuries. And as I was looking at divided Europe in the early centuries, I saw a power arising. Horns represent power. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. And he had a mouth speaking pompous words. Now, we need to see some things about this horn so we understand. First, this horn represents a power, a political or religious power. He arises among the ten horns. This horn does not come out of the head of the lion, Babylon. This horn does not come out of the back of the uh, bear, Medo-Persia. This horn does not come out of Greece. This horn does not come out of that uh, dragon-like beast. This horn comes up among the ten. If the ten horns are the divisions of Western Europe, we should expect in the early centuries a power rising in Western Europe. That's this little horn power. So this new power that we're talking about today has to rise in Western Europe because it comes up among the ten horns and the ten horns are the divisions of Europe. It arises after the ten horns. It doesn't arise in the days of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, or Rome. After the breakup of the Roman Empire, when was that? Between 351 AD, that's after Christ, and 476 AD, Rome fell apart. It was divided then. So we'd expect someplace around the 400s, 500s, a power rising in Western Europe. Now, the Bible says it has eyes like the eyes of a who, everybody? Eyes like the eyes of a what? Man. Now, what does that mean, eyes like the eyes of a man? Does anybody know what a prophet is called in the Bible? What's a prophet called in the Bible? What's that? A what? A seer. Why do you call a, a prophet a seer in the Bible? Because a prophet sees into the future with whose eyes? God's eyes. 
So the prophet sees with God's eyes. Eyes are a symbol of wisdom, intelligence. The prophet has God's eyes or intelligence. Does this power that comes up in Europe after the breakup of the Roman Empire have eyes like the eyes of God, like a prophet? No, he has eyes like the eyes of a man. This must be human wisdom. In the Bible, a prophet is called a seer because a prophet sees with God's eyes. So this is not divine wisdom. Here is a power based on human teachings. Here is a human religious system that's based on man's teachings that will grow up in the old Roman Empire. Notice the fourth thing about this power. This little horn, the Bible says it's diverse. The word diverse means different. Daniel 7 verse 24 says, he, the little horn, this power growing up in the Roman Empire, this power growing up in the early centuries, this power that's based on the wisdom of man, not the wisdom of God in religious matters. He shall be different from the first ones. What does that mean, he'll be different from the first ones? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome were political powers. This would be different, and it would be a religious political power that would rise. It wouldn't be like the great empires in the past. Here is a power that would rise that would be a human religious system coming out of the old Roman Empire. It would be based on man's teachings. It would be a religious political system that would rise. What would this power do in the early centuries? What did Daniel predict that it would do? Here it is. Daniel 7, verse 25. He shall speak great words against the Most High. How would he do that? He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. How would he do that? Here's how. He would think to change times and laws. Here is a power that would rise in the old Roman Empire. A power that would unite religious authority with with state authority. Here is a union of church and state in early centuries that would rise of the Roman Empire that would ultimately think that it had the authority and power to change the Ten Commandment law and change the Bible Sabbath. The Bible is very plain in this prophecy. When one nation follows another, it nearly always changes human laws. You see, when one nation overthrows another, when Babylon was overthrown by Medo-Persia, it Medo-Persia established their laws. When Medo-Persia was overthrown by Greece, Greece established their laws. When Rome overthrew Greece, Rome established its laws. But here is something different. This power would attempt to change the very law of God. This power would attempt to change the heart of that law that has to do with time. He changes times and laws. He would change the very Sabbath commandment. The little horn power would speak great things against the Most High by assuming God's prerogative. He would speak great things about the most most high by changing the very law or trying to do that that God wrote with his own finger on tables of stone. He would attempt to change divine laws. The Bible says in Daniel 7 verse 8, this power growing up in the old Roman Empire, this medieval church power that would become, would cast down the truth to the ground and he would do this and prosper. Tradition would come into the church rather than divine truth. Now, how did the change from Sabbath to Sunday actually occur? The Bible predicted it. The Bible predicted that a human power would come to try to change God's law, substitute tradition. Now, there were really two reasons for this change of the Bible Sabbath. The change of the Sabbath took place very, very gradually. It didn't come by God, didn't come by Jesus, didn't come by the disciples. It came by man's teachings into the church in the early centuries. Why would they do it? There were two reasons. First... In the second century, that's 120 A.D., 140 A.D., there was a great Jewish revolt against the Romans. The Romans were ruling. There was a great Jewish revolt against the Romans. The Romans put down that revolt by persecuting the Jews. But since all early Christians came from a Jewish background, the Roman authorities associated the Christians with the Jews. All through the book of Acts, particularly early in the book of Acts, you see Jewish converts making up the largest portion of the church early in the book of Acts. The 3,000s baptized on the day of Pentecost all came from a Jewish background. They were Christians now. The Roman authorities didn't distinguish between the Jews and the Christians. They thought the Christians were simply a Jewish sect. So they were persecuted. They were not welcome in the old Roman Empire. 
Therefore, church leaders were willing at times to gradually try to disassociate themselves from the Jews. As early as the second century, these Christian leaders began to worship on Sunday once a year in honor of the resurrection. Gradually, Sunday worship became more and more prevalent in the church, not by a command of God, but, but, but because church leaders didn't want to face Roman persecution. There was a second reason, and the second reason was this. It was very common for the pagans to worship on Sunday. It was very common all through history. The pagans looked up at the largest luminous body of the heavens, and they saw that as the sun god. The Egyptians, of course, worshipped Amun-Ra, the sun god. The Babylonians worshipped Bel Marduk, the sun god. The uh, Persians worshipped Mithraism, the sun god. The Romans had their deities of the sun. When Constantine, the pagan Roman emperor in the 4th century, sensed that his empire was falling apart, he wanted to do something that would unify the empire. He wondered, how can we unify the empire? Constantine had become a Christian. But how could Christianity become more acceptable to the pagans? Oh, if the early church would allow pagans to have Sunday as a day of worship, Sunday, the day of the sun, the day that had been the history of sun worship through the ages, and simply change it to a day of worship for Christ, it would be easier to get them to worship on that day. Why was the Sabbath changed? For two reasons. Christians wanted to disassociate themselves. Some did. Early Christian leaders wanted to disassociate themselves from the Jews. They didn't want to be persecuted. Why did they do it? Because the pagans were already worshiping the sun god. So why not now just shift that day from the Bible Sabbath that God commanded, the Bible Sabbath that the disciples kept, the Bible Sabbath that Jesus kept, why not shift that authority and just worship on Sunday in honor of the resurrection with no command from God, no command from Christ, and no command from the disciples. Now notice how this is borne out in history. I've told you the story today. Now let me show it to you in the history books and the encyclopedias. Here's the Bible encyclopedia, page 561, Dr. John Eddy, uh, a doctor of divinity and a doctor of laws, a lawyer as well as a doctor of divinity. Sabbath, and I'm quoting from his encyclopedia, a Hebrew word signifying rest. Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week, because it was the day on which they worshipped the sun. So all through history, you have this conflict between Sabbath, the day God gave, the day God created to be rested upon, the day that was a symbol of his love and worship and fellowship, and Sunday, the luminous body in the heavens, the day that was symbolized as worship of the sun. How could Constantine unite his empire? It was crumbling. He thought, I have to do something to bring it. Together, he issued the first Sunday law, and here we have it in history, A.D. 321, and I'm quoting from Constantine's Sunday law, on the venerable. Venerable means honorable, the day of worship. Uh, Venerable, that is the esteemed, on the esteemed day of the sun. Let the magistrates and people residing in the cities rest, and let the shops be closed. So here's an attempt to unify the whole empire with Sunday being called the venerable day of the sun. Constantine became a Christian. Here's a picture of one of his original coins. On one side, you have Constantine. On the other side, you have Constantine under the authority of the sun god. Constantine seemed couldn't give up that luminous body, the sun god. What happened? Church leaders were willing to compromise because they didn't want to be persecuted by the Romans. Church leaders also wanted a flood of new converts, and so they were willing to introduce something as a bridge to paganism Sunday to make Christianity acceptable to the pagans. In the days of Constantine, political leaders, church and state, united. Now here's the Catholic world, page 809, March 1994. This describes historically what was going on quite accurately. The church, the sun, was a foremost god with heathendom. So the Catholic world says, yes, the sun was a foremost god in heathenism. There is, in truth, something royal kingly about the sun, making it a fit emblem of Jesus, the son of justice. Of course, that section is not quite accurate at all. Then it says, hence the church in these countries would seem to have said, keep the old pagan name, it shall remain consecrated and sanctified. 
And thus, Pagan Sunday, dedicated to Balder, that's the sun god, became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. So they kind of trace the history and they say, the church has the authority to change the day from Saturday to Sunday. It did that in the early centuries. It did it because it's easier if the pagans have the pagan Sunday dedicated to their god Balder, and that becomes the Christian Sunday. Bible seekers have this question to ask. Where do I find authority? Do I find authority in God's word? Do I find authority in the Bible? Do I find authority in the Ten Commandments? Or do I find it in the traditions of the church? The Bible said in Daniel 7, verse 25, that a power would rise. He would think to change the very law of God. God warns us of this change. He points out what's going to happen in the last days, and he predicts that there'll be a revival. God's word predicts that there'll be a great revival of interest in the word of God, and that men and women would be called back to worship the true God on the Creator's day, the Bible Sabbath. I was brought up in a lovely Roman Catholic home. I was educated by the priests as a boy. I began to read my Bible when I was in my teens, And I came across many of the things that we are studying here in this lecture. I was quite surprised and quite shocked. And of course, as you can imagine, there was quite a struggle in my own life after being educated by the priest, after memorizing the Mass in Latin. And I began to struggle with it. And here was the fundamental question in my mind. Is the Bible my only authority? Or is the tradition of the church for me greater authority than the authority of the Bible? Are the commands of church leaders back in those early centuries, are they more significant than the commands of Christ? Does anybody have the authority to change God's law? In this struggle that I was personally going through, I remember going to my catechism, and this catechism is called the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. And as I went to my catechism, I read this. You know, the catechism is set up in questions and answers, and I read, which is the Sabbath day? And in my catechism, I read, Saturday is the Sabbath day. I was amazed. I looked at the next question in the catechism. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday, instead of Sabbath? Answer, because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. I began to sense that in the early centuries, the church changed the Sabbath, not based on a command of God, not based on the teachings of Jesus or the disciples, but based on a compromise to make Christianity popular in the empire. I went to the Catholic Encyclopedia. I said, I really need answers to this. But I want to go to the ultimate, the fundamental sources. So I went to the Catholic Encyclopedia, and this is what I read, the Catholic Encyclopedia. And we'll give you all of these references because I want you to check them out. You're truth seekers. Truth can always bear investigation. And I want you to look into it because, indeed, if God has a day of rest and worship, if the true Sabbath is written with God's finger on tables of stone, if man has changed that by their own admission, and if in the last days, in an age of evolution, God's calling us back to worship the true creator, can anything be more important than a command written with the finger of God when he says, remember the Sabbath and mankind is forgotten? I had to lay my prejudices aside. I had to lay aside a tradition that I was struggling and battling and fighting for. I had to say, God, please, Lord, Reveal to me your truth and your truth alone. Here's the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 4, 153. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. So it says the church changed the day. Notice it says the church made the third commandment. When you read the commandments in the Bible, the Sabbath is the fourth. Why do they say third here? Well, because the first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second commandment is, thou shalt not worship any graven image. That one was dropped out of my catechism. So that means the second, uh, don't take the, the third, don't take the name of the Lord in vain, became the second. That meant the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath became the third. That means you come down through nine and you're missing one. So what do you do? The Sabbath, that, the commandment, thou shalt not covet, has to be divided in two. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's goods. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. So that was made in two, you see, because you dropped the one on images. That's why the Bible said that a power would rise in the medieval church, that the law of God, he'll change times and laws. 
Does the church have the authority to change God's law? See, that is the real question. It's the question that I struggled with. It's the question every sincere Christian struggles with. Does the church have the authority to change God's law? What is the foundation of our faith? Is the foundation of our faith the Bible? Or the foundation of our faith what man says? I remember those days that I poured over my Bible many, many years ago, and I said, Jesus, for me, the foundation of my faith has to be the Bible. The foundation of my faith has to be what you say. The foundation of my faith cannot be what man says. Because if man can change God's law, what else can he change in the Bible? If man can change the commandments, what else can he change in the Bible? Maybe it is that the Christian church today largely has drifted away from the original teachings of the Bible. And if they have, and we're living just before the coming of Jesus, Jesus is calling us back to the fullness of his truth. The question for you and for me, is who's our guide, tradition of the Bible? Am I willing to hold on to some traditions? A tradition like a flat earth, and uh, that if you go far enough, the boat's going to fall off the earth? A tradition like a spider that has six legs? You know, wh- am I willing to hold off on to some traditions? A tradition like uh, the earth is the whole center of the uh, solar system? Where is our authority? What is our guide? Is it the tradition of men or the Bible? I know the reason that you are here today is because deep within your heart, you've said, Jesus, I want to follow you. Deep within your heart, you've said, Lord, I want to follow your word. You see, the question is, who's our master? Is our master church leaders or is our master Jesus Christ? And this is true not only in the Sabbath, but it's in everything in life. Once you give your mind to church leaders and allow church leaders to determine for you what truth is, then you give your mind to man who ultimately can lead you on a path of deception. Now, you might ask me, well, well, well Mark, I have a question. Did these church leaders know what they were doing? We don't judge them. We don't judge their motives. The Bible says, judge not that you not be judged. We don't judge others who sincerely keep the first day of the week. The Lord does not call us to judge others, but God calls us deep within our hearts to follow his truth. The question is not what they are doing. The question is not why are millions in the world, if they're sincere, keeping the first day of the week. That's not the issue. The issue is God has called you. The issue is God is speaking to you. The issue is God is bringing you back to understand his word. The question is, what has more authority, the church or God's will? What's the basis of authority in spiritual matters for you and for me? The basis of authority in spiritual matters is the word of God. For you and for me, the reason we have come here night after night is to discover God's will. When you look at the Bible, the Sabbath must be important. Just like Satan said to Eve, it's just a matter of a tree. That's insignificant. The issue wasn't a tree. The issue was what God said. God gave the Sabbath to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And the Bible said he rested on the Sabbath. He blessed the Sabbath. He sanctified it. If the Sabbath wasn't important, why would Jesus say the Sabbath was made for man? And why would God give it to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? If the Sabbath was not important, why would God write it on tables of stone with his own finger, never, ever to be changed or altered? If the Sabbath wasn't important, why would it be given to God's people as a sign down through the centuries? If the Sabbath was not important, why would Jesus Christ keep it? And why would Jesus say, if you love me, keep my commandments? Our choice, your choice, my choice is this. Will I say, Jesus, I want to follow the Bible and the Bible only? Or will I say, I will accept a compromise that came in by tradition? The church admits openly and acknowledges fully and honestly that it changed the Sabbath. The church admits that this is commanded by tradition. Both Catholics and Protestants, many of them, acknowledge this. So the question is, do I want to follow the Bible and the Bible only of the traditions of men? Will I follow the way of Jesus Christ in Christ alone or the way of religious leaders? Will I go back to the New Testament model of Jesus and Jesus only? Will I follow God's law and have his law as the foundation of my faith? Or will I follow man's dogmas? Will I listen to God's instruction? Or will it be human teaching? Will my way be God's way? Or will my way 
be man's way. For the Christian, the only logical decision is, Lord, I want to follow the Bible. I want to follow Jesus. I want to walk in the way of your law. I want to follow your instruction. Lord, even if this is new. I remember the first time I heard it. I thought to myself, how can this be true? But I checked it out. Went to the Bible. Looked at history. Saw that around the world there were millions and millions and millions of sincere, honest, Bible-believing Christians that were keeping the Bible Sabbath. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12 speaks of God's last day people, speaks of the significance, the importance of following Jesus Christ in the final crisis and worshiping the Creator. Revelation says, here is the patience. That's the endurance of the saints. That's the believers. In other words, here's my end time people. Here are the people that have hung on. Here are the people that have not compromised. Here are the people that have not sold out. Here are the people that will follow me and follow me till end time. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We are not saved by the commandments of God. We're saved by grace in Jesus Christ and grace alone. But when we are saved by God's grace, it leads us to be obedient. And we want to be obedient and follow Jesus. It leads us to accept the gift that he has given us, and he gave us a gift that comes right from the Garden of Eden, and it came right through the Old Testament, right through the New Testament, a gift that we'll be worshiping with him and accepting in heaven, the gift of the Bible Sabbath. And Jesus says to you, do you love me enough to follow me? Do you love me enough to step out from society? Do you love me enough to make me your Lord and Savior forever and ever and ever and follow in my footsteps a journey of discovery? We come around the corner on the road of life and Jesus reveals to us the magnificence and the beauty of his truth. And he invites us to follow him. Would you like to say today, Jesus, I want to follow you. I'll not judge others. I'll not condemn them for what they are doing or not doing. I leave them alone with God. Far be it from us to vilify or judge another. That's not Christian. That's not what Jesus wants us to do. But when I stand before the judgment bar of God, he's not going to ask me, what did others do? He's going to say, Mark, did you follow me in my word? Were you willing to step out from society Were you willing to step out from the popular way? Were you willing to step out from the broad way? Were you willing to whatever it takes do to follow me? I know that's the desire of your heart. Gavin's going to come and sing. And If you have your card, and if there's any question at all about this, just write it on the back of the card. But I'd like you to take your card. It says, since I love Jesus, I desire to obey him. Would you like to make an act of special commitment to Jesus today? And say, Jesus, I love you, and I want to obey you. Jesus, I love you, and I want to follow you. As we tick the card, it's that sign of our heart's commitment. If it's clear to you that the true Bible Sabbath is Saturday, and you want to say, Lord, I want to lovingly obey you, I want to keep your day holy, tick that. If it's not clear and you want to write a question, just put a question mark there and write your question on the back if you want. That's fine. Or if it's clear but you still have a question, still tick it. If you need additional reading material, we are here to help make Bible truth as clear as possible for you. And if you need more material, more resource material, we want to provide that. Just make this a time of meditation. Open your heart and say, Jesus, I want to do whatever you want me to do. If this is your truth... I want to follow it. Listen now as Gavin comes and sings. When Jesus speaks to us, he never asks us, what will your father do? What will your mother do? What will your sister do? What will your brother do? He simply says to us, will you follow me? Will you step out to follow me? Listen as Gavin sings just now. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Oh, will. 
Our ushers are going to collect the cards right now, and you can drop your card in the basket. And while they're doing that, I want to talk to our television audience. Millions and millions of people around the world have the opportunity to hear this broadcast. And no doubt there are thousands of them watching today. If you're watching in a home with a little group by television, you might be watching in a church by television, you may be in a large stadium someplace watching by big screen. If you're watching by television, I want to make a special appeal to you. You did not turn on this television program by accident. You did not turn on this program simply by chance. Jesus Christ, the creator of the whole universe, is speaking to you. He invites you to accept his gift, this love gift of the Bible Sabbath. He invites you to follow his word. He invites you to step out and follow him. He invites you to make a decision to be free from the traditions of men and the teachings of human doctrine to follow totally and alone the word of the living God. Wherever you're watching, I'm going to invite you right now to make that commitment to Jesus. Those who are here in this audience, our ushers are going to come forward And they're going to stand with the cards that symbolize the decisions of our hearts. And here in this audience, we're going to pray. But wherever you are, if God is leading you to follow Jesus, and if you want to say, Jesus, whatever you want me to do, I want to follow you. Watching by television, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And here in this audience today, as an encouragement to our television audience, I know you filled out your card but as an encouragement to our television audience so they can see your commitment of faith, as I bow my head to pray, would you just like to lift your hand and say, Jesus, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Jesus, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Look at that. Television audience right here. Here is your symbol of a commitment of faith in Jesus Christ that we together want to follow him. Now, television audience, would you like to raise your hand and say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I want to do it. Wherever you are, just lift your hand up over TV right now as I pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for those who have come to this auditorium. I thank you for their faith, their courage, their desire to follow Jesus, their willingness to walk in his footsteps. We see the Sabbath not as bondage, not as some legalistic requirement, but as a marvelous love gift the sign, the symbol of creation. We give our hearts to you just now to follow you today and forever. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for joining us today for this Discoveries program here from Melbourne, Australia. If you would like a resume of the program today, we've placed the information on the screen. You'll be able to go back and review the presentation and keep the inspiration in your heart alive. Until next time, remember... The Word of God says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee, because he trusts in you. A life of trust is a life of joy. We'll see you next time.